Well, hey, hey, guys, welcome to the studio. I'm excited. Today, the results of our tests of whether the species of wood makes any difference at all in a solid body electric guitar. We've got the data. We're going to get straight on to it. Let's get to it. Listen to this. This is about 10 seconds in on a low E, wood one. I love it. That was captured from an amplifier that was miked near the experiment at a distance of 24 inches. But let's not listen to the amp. Let's listen to the actual wood itself. Same spot, and I'm going to play the whole sample. This is off of a DI, as suggested by experimental scientist Dave Church, that we capture everything on DI and not just what we're hearing in the room. So this is the actual sound here. Here's that exact same example, but mic'd up from the amp where we did have the gain turned up. This is a 22 watt tube amp. So I'm going to show you all the examples that we captured from the different types of woods. I do think it's easier to hear the difference when we're listening to what's actually coming out of the amp versus the DI, only because it's hard for me to manage the volumes of the DI that tend to start kind of loud and then get extraordinarily quiet right around the time that we're hearing those changes in the overtones. I will give you some examples along the way of both, but let's concentrate on what's coming out of the amp. Okay, one more time. This is wood one at about 10 seconds in. And you see how big this volume line here is. I can tell you, I could just let that play and play and play. You want to hear it about a minute later? Here's what it's doing about a minute later. It's still doing that. But let's take a look at wood two coming out of the amplifier at the exact same spot and listen to what it's doing. Wood two. Doesn't really have any kind of a harmonic overtone kicking in. As we saw up here on wood one, which went into like a full minute of sustain here. Wood two is pretty much done. Let's take a look at wood three. About 10 seconds in. We can see the behavior very similar to what we saw in wood one that we did not see in wood two. And again, about a minute later, it's still doing that. And then that brings us to wood number four. And just by looking at the chart here, you can see that ab something absolutely astounding happened. Here it is about 10 seconds in.
So those were some of the big highlights of the big differences that we noticed between the woods. But did we always notice big differences between the woods? No, we didn't. It really depended on a few different factors. Let me show you an instance where it really didn't make too much difference. This is a G-string 17 gauge DI, wood number one. Here's wood number two. Again, DI. Here's wood number three, DI. And here's wood number four, DI. Now the G-string test was the test that we actually ran first, and even under amplified conditions, it was not yielding drastically different results. Let me show you some of the amplified versions of that. Wood one amped on G. Let's try wood two. Let's switch to wood three. And finally, wood four. Now, when we came to our second test, we had changed strings over to a low E string. And you can see here's wood one, there's the DI, and here's what we got out of the amplifier. And even at this point, running the amp at about 100 decibels, we saw some differences in the decay characteristics from one, one wood to another. Uh, and tone-wise, we found, again, a fair amount of similarity but I will let you be the judge. Okay, here's wood one. We're listening to amped. Uh, again, it's, I think, a little bit easier to kind of gauge what we're really hearing. And that's what brought us to the third part of our test, where we essentially just brought the gain up on the amplifier to maximum. At this point, we measured the dB at 3 feet from the amp at 116 dB. Not fooling around, I was wearing hearing protection to do that. 
but this is a volume that I might play guitar on stage with. Uh, it's a small 112 amp, 22 watts. I think that this would mimic like a live experience type of behavior in these tones. And let's take a look at these. Okay, it's harder to see this on the DI, but what we find is that there is actually a sustaining level that matches what we heard out of the amplifier under those conditions where the note is sustaining out. And like we see here in Wood 2, where the decay in the DI is mirrored by a decay out of the amplified tone. When we get over to Wood 3, we can see that the DI does maintain some volume, as does the amplified tone, and that sustain would have gone on forever. And it was Wood 4 that gave us, I think, the most interesting behavior that we witnessed at, at this point, where you can see the DI die out and start coming back up a little bit as the amp decays out the original tone and starts bringing a harmonic that fades back in. So let me zoom you way in on this one because I think it's one of the more fascinating results that we heard. And here we are zoomed in. This was what Wood 4 was doing through the DI. We could see it getting louder and through the amp. An interesting kind of crossover point between the foundation, the foundational tone and the harmonic that we got. Let's listen to this DI. And you can hear it definitely fade out. I'm going to fast forward you to the end. This is what it was doing by the end of that recording. Again, it's about a minute here. That's really quiet on the, uh, the meter here. Let me bring that up so you're actually hearing what I hear. That's the DI. Okay. The amp does have an inherent compression to it, so let's take a look on the amplified tone, what we have here. Let me bring your level back down so I don't kill you. We're going to listen to the beginning of it. Let's listen during this transitional point here. And that's just going to keep ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. I could have gone to have a sandwich and come back and that note still would have been going. And here's all the data that we captured. The top row of each color is DI. The second row is what we heard out of the amplifier. Everything in pink is wood one. Everything in lavender is wood two. In light blue, we have wood three. And finally, in pink, we have wood four. That's the capture from the experiment there, guys. And now that you've seen the results, let me talk to you a little bit about the experiment itself. We started with four planks of wood. If you watched video number one, you saw us sourcing the wood from a wood expert. And you saw us talk to experimental scientist Dave Church about how to set this instrument up. All four of these were built exactly the same way. and They're really just kind of like a plank of wood. Uh, with a tuner and uh, bridge pieces, and they're strung through body, I guess you could say. We had to do a little bit of milling in this area to make it down to a dimension that a tuner could fit on, so it's normally three-quarter inch thickness all around, except for in that spot we had to take it down to half inch so we could put a tuner on it. Also gave us a little bit of better of a break angle on it. You're probably asking yourself, where's the pickup? Well, we didn't want the potential of having even four identically built pickups, one on each of these, and we actually did source enough pickups to do it. 
but somebody had mentioned to us, well, the difference in the windings and the magnets from one pickup, even at the same design, could be different. So we used the exact same pickup on every single guitar. And this is what it was, guys. This is a pickup that I had designed a ways back, just very simply wired to an output jack, no potentiometer. And this would just get clipped on, butted up against uh, the block of wood that held the bridge on the guitar, and I'll show you this. We also did not want pole pieces because you could have been offset a little bit from side to side, and people said, oh, you know, you caught it more on this one than on that one. This was exactly centered, and it was clipped in place on the same spot of every single experiment we did. And how did we pluck the string? How did I make sure me as a human didn't overpluck one or underpluck another or do, you know, drag my the flesh of my finger beyond the pick to kind of bring a harmonic out? Well, we built this little simple thing. It's well, just two pieces of wood on a hinge. And on the top, we just bolted a yellow Tortex pick right into the wood. And it was gravity driven and set up with a pull pin that I couldn't possibly alter how this thing was pick picking the string. And then with some foam down here, so when I pulled the pin, the pin would drop. Boom. It would hit the foam and then not cause like any impact sound, so it would never come in contact with the actual instrument itself. Every picking was the same. And as far as how much grab we set up for the pick, that was actually the simplest part of this. All we had to do was set a block of wood up to a line with the string. Take this, push it up against the block, and it was about an inch above the string. Move the block of wood, pull the pin, and I was getting the same plucking on every single stroke. No humans involved, just gravity. Up till now, I've really been trying to keep my mouth shut. But as we were designing this experiment along with experimental scientist Dave Church, he said it's okay to go into an experiment with a hypothesis. Do you have an idea of what the results may be? What are you actually testing for? And I got to thank Dave again for getting on a Zoom call with me for over an hour. If you watched part one of the video series, you'll hear some of the instructions that he gave us to make sure this experiment was following scientific methods so that it would yield data that we could rely on as accurate. So he walked us through a lot of the ideas you saw to like get the human element out of it, make sure that from test to test to test, these were all very, very consistent as, as much as we could do. But I'll admit, I kind of knew the results before I did the test. It, we put a lot of effort into sourcing the wood and reaching out to a, a scientist and Dr. Nicole Anzalone, who brought us down to her, her audiology lab. That's in part two of the video series. And you should see the results and the charts that we got from testing the wood before we even built them into guitars. We knew a great deal about how these pieces of wood were going to behave in terms of uh, audio and tone. We already knew that before this even started. But I will also admit, I knew that there would be differences in the results of this experiment for a couple of reasons. I was a guitar builder for about 20 years. I, I studied under a luthier named Jack Wiskowski as an apprentice and then ultimately ended up taking over his clientele. I also ran a music store and I was an authorized service technician for Fender, Gibson, Taylor, Martin, Ibanez, Jackson. The list goes on and on. I had my hand in it. So when I started this testing, I knew right out of the gate that my plan was to build identical guitars and to put them in proximity of an amplifier. And the reason why is because amplifiers actually move sound in the room and guitars behave like a sail. They vibrate along with whatever sound that's in the room and they will impart that energy back into the vibration of the string. That's why you saw such a drastic change in how this sustain or feedback happened when I went from 100 dB up to 116 dB. All of a sudden, the sustain characteristics came to life in some woods and not so much in other woods. And if you're curious to find out more about how that works, 
there's a lot of research that's been done. You can go pull up some videos. It's called sympathetic vibration or sympathetic resonance. And it's one of the reasons that I keep little foam strips inside the sound hole of all my acoustic guitars in my tracking room. I have like half dozen acoustic guitars hanging up there and I have a singer go, ah, and the next thing you know, I got strings all ringing in sympathy, what they call singing along. So the foam stops those strings from vibrating. We're no stranger to it here in the studio. It's something that definitely happens. And you might be curious, why did I choose the four woods that I did choose? Pine, oak, ash, and maple. Why did I choose those four? Well, for a couple reasons. I wanted to make sure that I used woods that we commonly saw in solid body and guitars. And I wanted to make sure that we used some woods that were not commonly used. Some of them are legendary, like pine. I hope this helps to answer the question. I don't think it's an absolute answer, and I'll tell you why. Some people, and I, myself included, I'll just plug my electric guitar into a DI box, and I'll use some amp sim, and maybe I'll be under headphones, where the air in the room is not necessarily getting back to the guitar and causing it to behave one way or another. Would I hear a difference in tone from one wood to another under those circumstances, this test was not designed to gauge that. The other thing is we tended to see, with an amplifier involved, we tended to see that a lot of the changes in behavior of these guitar instruments was over time. It wasn't something that you necessarily heard when the pick hit the string, but 10 seconds later or 20 seconds later, the behavior characteristics would become more evident at that time. So if I am literally going pick, 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 and I'm playing through five distortion boxes into an amp that's in a different room or into an amp sim, I may not experience much of a difference from one wood to another. And that's totally fair. There are people who play that way and myself included. But there are also people that do play a guitar into an amplifier, as it had been done for the past 70 years or whatever. And some of those amps get pretty big. You know, people crank up a Marshall full stack uh, to 11, and they ride the lightning. They just Everything they play is going to have some kind of long, endless sustain to it. Uh, like Nigel Tufnell says in Spinal Tap, you know, that one sustains forever. You hit a note, you go have lunch, you come back, and uh, it's still going. Well, that does have to do with the wood, and it has to do with how loud your amp is and how close you are to the amp. These things are also true. So my job really was to try to be as fair as possible, to try to be as scientific as I possibly could about it, to try to involve experts from Thomas Derby, who works at the lumber mill that sourced the wood for us, Dr. Nicole Anzalone, who graciously invited us to her audiology lab to do testing on the wood before we built them. That's in part two of our video series. And to make sure that scientist Dave Church looked at the experiment fully and gave us the endorsement, and all the experts involved said they knew that if we heard any differences in the data at the end of this experiment, it could only be attributed to the species of wood. So I'll invite you to go back and watch part one and part two if you haven't already. Thank you for sticking around and not only watching the results of the scientific testing, which took us a long time and put a fair amount of effort into it, but I want to invite you over to Facebook. We have a group called Recording Tips, and these videos often parallel the discussions that we're having on this video channel. You can come over to Facebook and chat with us about it. If you have any concerns about this video or questions or comments, just make a comment down below. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. We're coming out with new content all the time, and I'm very happy to answer questions in the comments below. Yes, I, in fact, had a blast doing this. It was a lot of hard work. And I got more work to do. Let's get to it.